All rise. The Court of Appeals Division One is now in session. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. We're here today in SA fifteen zero zero four two. Lori Jean Sheets versus Kathleen Mead with Real Party and Interest, Bonnie Jean Reynolds. Uh, we have conference this matter. We've considered the, uh, the briefing that's been provided. Uh, each side will have 20 minutes for their argument. We'd ask you to identify yourself and your client when you begin your argument. Uh, these proceedings are being recorded. Uh, both there will be an audio and a video recording. Uh, and with that, uh, petitioner, you may proceed. Good morning. May it please the court, I'm Keith Berkshire, attorney for Lori Sheets, the mother in this action. It's absolute legal fiction that this child was born in wedlock. But it's a legal fiction that the legislature gets to endorse because the only rights that Ms. Reynolds or any third party can have or any non-parent can have is if the legislature creates them. There's no underlying fundamental right of a non-parent because non-parent visitation is purely a creature of statute, of statute. Are the best interests of the child even relevant in this case? They're relevant if, the, if there's subject matter jurisdiction. If subject matter jurisdiction is found, but you're saying there isn't. I'm saying that there's no case law that dictates that a non-parent has any rights absent legislature creating them. This has been held in cases like Fink by the Arizona Supreme Court when Arizona used to only limit non-parent visitation to grandparents. They found that there was no underlying right unless the legislature found it. I understand that point, but the, the corollary of your argument is that the best interests of the child are irrelevant here. I guess you could say that, this, that a, a plethora of cases have held that way. And that's your, that's your position? I, w I guess it, underlying it, it somewhat is because there has to be jurisdiction here. And I think you could look at the Marco um, C. Shaughnessy case that says that even if the result is harsh, that um, where this court says you don't, get to dic you don't get to second guess the legislature's policy in creating the statute. I, I have to wonder if the legislature even thought about <clears throat> some of the policy consequences of the statute it enacted, because if you, if you draw out a matrix of the possible results under the statute read according to its plain terms, you come up with some fairly arbitrary distinctions. An adoptive parent of one child has superior rights to a natural parent of another child who happened to have been uh, divorced at the time the child was born, um, but a parent who had a petition for dissolution pending at the time of the birth, but was still married, has superior rights. Uh, it, it, these don't seem to be um, consequences that the legislature likely envisioned. I think they're absolutely consequences the legislature envisioned because there's this this statute has been in existence in some form in Arizona for the better part of close to three decades. We've had constitutional challenges whether in that exact type of situation where a step parent was found that they they could their adoption meant less um, than a two party adoption, and that's been upheld by this court in Jackson v. Tang Green, where this court has repeatedly said that the legislature gets to create these rights. There is no other right except for if the legislature creates it. And, the, and every time that there has been a change to this statute, is it, it has been upheld constitutionally. And like I said, one of the main ones was in, by the Arizona Supreme Court in the Fink case, which you could argue that the same issues you raised, Judge Swan, about you know potentially a, prior to Fink, a step-parent could have had a better relationship than a grandparent with the child. A, uh, 
a sibling, something else that could have had, could have filed for non-parent visitation, could have had a better relationship. But the Supreme Court said in Fink, too bad. We say the legislature gets to dictate those parties. And there's all kinds of intricacies and um, potential theories here that we're, you know, I mean, you could, it, it, prior to Fink, a, one of the children's older siblings could not have, uh, or prior to the legislature changing the statute after the Supreme Court did Fink, one of the child's siblings could not have sued for visitation, which obviously can occur now after the legislature changed the, the statute. But prior to Fink, that was, a, that was an issue, and it was an issue specifically dealt with by the Supreme Court and Fink, that, that those situations um, were outside of the statute because the legislature did not give the trial court jurisdiction to do it. But and then I, the legislature changed course after seeing what its what its statute had wrought. And and I wonder here, because we're dealing with the interplay of the, the legal fiction created by Title VIII and the language in 25409, uh, and, and, I, and I have to wonder <clears throat> what, what the legislature's view would be. It, it, it says that well, I, I think there's an implication that parents who have children in wedlock are somehow entitled to superior rights than those who have them out of wedlock. Yet the underlying assumption is that the, the wedlock fails at some point. Um, <clears throat> what, what do you think the rationale is for that? Why, why is a failed marriage better than no marriage at all? Well, my first argument was you, to get to that argument, you'd have to get past the plain language of the statute, which is that. Eight one seventeen says I'm just that it's building. Why? I'm not. I'm not. I, I don't. I, I don't know if I if I'm able to interpret the legislative's intent, but we can definitely interpret the legislature's intent if we look at twenty five four zero nine H, where the legislature admits adoptions terminate non party non parents rights, and they only exempt one type of adoption. Clearly, when the legislature did this in two thousand thirteen, when they amended the statute in 2013 in SB 1127 when they combined 25409 and 20, the prior 25415 and by the way used the language of 25409 not the language of 25415 for the standard which had been around longer they only exempt one type of adoption from that and that is step parents so clearly the legislature if you're going to look at intent the legislature knew that step parent adoptions and um, single parent adoptions existed in 2013 and they chose to exempt one type and that one type was step parents i wonder what they'd say now because uh, i'm sure it hasn't escaped anybody's notice that there is uh, just an anomaly of timing here right if this adoption had happened today both petitioner and the real party in interest could have jointly adopted and then the, re then the result would be entirely different. But because it happened a few years ago, um, same people, same intent, same everything, different result. And the same argument could, could be made for anybody that, I mean, w of course my client does not acknowledge that um, in disputes that they were going to jointly adopt. However, I'm just even, they could have. even if that was the case, after the October 16th date for same-sex marriages in Arizona, you could make the same argument that, well, I have cut, I have property rights because I was going to marry this guy, but for the fact that the state didn't allow it. So now I have property rights. I mean, that's a pretty big rabbit hole to go down of we could have now. But I'd also point out that every case in Arizona, including all the ones prior to the 2013 statute, which is, this is a very new statute. Every case in Arizona on this issue was a same-sex relationship. Thomas and Egan, these are the cases on, I mean, it's not like Arizona hasn't thought that same-sex couples, you know, that one party adopts and so forth. I mean, if you really want to look at legislative intent, you have to assume that when the legislature changes a statute that they know of case law and they're doing something, there's some reason to change it. Thomas, the case prior to this, the, the, one of the main cases on same-sex relationships and non-parents having um, any sort of legal decision-making, the only reason in Thomas that, that the court found subject matter jurisdiction was the child only had to been, at that time under 25415, that the parents weren't not, were not married. So you could easily read the legislative's in, legislature's intent, if you wanted to, to overrule Thomas. 
because they specifically changed the criteria that this court relied upon in Thomas to actually grant any sort of non-parent visitation and find that it had jurisdiction. Because in Thomas, there was only one factor. Now, there's two factors under the under 2549, where it has to be out of wedlock and not married. In Thomas, it was only not married. So the legislative intent could easily be seen as to fix that or change that. <coughs> At the end of the day, we think that the Maricopa County juvenile case, the 502-394, let's refer to as the Maricopa County case because so I don't have to keep repeating the number. Case. The 1996 case controls. This court again <coughs> utilized that same rationale in 2000 in Jackson v. Tangreen when they found that there was no um, equal protection violation for step-parent adoptions versus two-party adoptions. So we don't believe that there's actually subject matter jurisdiction to even get to any of the um, any of the findings in this case. However, if we do get to the findings in this case and the actual order, the underlying order is a pretty egregious violation of Troxel and Egan. And 130 days, to say that 130 days of parenting time to a non-parent does not allow that party to direct the upbringing is just implausible. I mean, that's no Arizona case that, that I've found published. The only real published cases in Arizona on non-parent visitation that have upheld any. The one is Grayville v. Dodge. Eight hours per month floating based on the, the actual parent's um, wishes and so it doesn't interfere with schedules. This is factors and factors, I guess, what would that be? 400 times the amount of parenting time as Grayville allowed for. And to say that it doesn't allow the, the, the person to direct the upbringing is simply wrong. They get every other weekend, three weeks of vacation in the summer. As I was looking at this this morning and doing another, or yesterday and doing another appeal on a very similar issue, um, I thought that if, if the court upholds that 130 days is not parenting time, then every parent in every custody dispute is going to utilize that case and say that you could never give me under 130 days because that's not parenting time. I'm not directing the upbringing of my child if you give me less than 130 days because if, if, 100, if in this case 130 days does not control upbringing, then the reverse is true in every single custody case, which is a scary um, potential precedent to set. A lot of the true equal um, parenting uh, uh, lobby would love it, but um, potentially not a, lo the, a lot of the other ones. The other thing that I think ha is very important here as far as the subject matter jurisdiction goes is the simple fact that the court never actually found the child was born out of wedlock. The court modified the statute, and I've read this uh, minute entry over and over just to make sure I wasn't missing this. The court only found that Visitation, I'll, I'll quote to you the, the minute entry. The court finds that visitation is appropriate as the child was born or adopted out of wedlock. The court specifically modified the statute. So there's never even been a finding that the court even has jurisdiction under the actual statute because all the court did is, I mean, I don't want to say all the court did, the court modified the, modified the statute to suit its needs and found that the child was adopted out of wedlock for whatever I have no idea what that actually means legally because there's no such term. Neither party raised that below, presumably. That the that the took issue with the court's reading. Well, m mother did file a, a motion for a new trial after the um, uh, ruling did come out, um, just saying that the court did not meet the, the standard. I don't think I'm not sure if they raised that issue, but even if it wasn't raised, the court can't grant subject matter jurisdiction on to itself, which is what modifying the statute did, in our opinion. The This isn't a novel first time reading of 8117. We're not the first case. There's been multiple Arizona cases, at least two published exactly saying what we're stating, which is there is a correlation. The legislature knows there's a correlation. And 
this court specifically is as two published cases saying that there is a correlation between those statutes as it relates to non-parent visitation and subject matter jurisdiction. Um, I would point out too one of the main arguments that that uh, Ms. Reynolds' counsel is making is that this isn't a subject matter jurisdiction case. Uh, specifically, Thomas, it, this court says it is because it says if you don't meet the exact prongs of the statute, we can't um, grant jurisdiction upon ourselves. The Supreme Court in Fink said it. The uh, In Hughes, um, this court said it um, repeatedly that if you don't meet the statutory factors, it is not you cannot grant subject matter or it, there's no subject matter jurisdiction. But ultimately, does it matter to your to your position whether it's subject matter jurisdiction or simply a question of the court's substantive powers? Probably not. The you know the <coughs> interestingly, very few of the cases come out and actually say subject matter jurisdiction. We use authority. The Supreme Court's used the word authority repeatedly. They're, you know, they use the word powers in, in one or two cases on this issue. But um, at the end of the day, I don't, it doesn't really matter. Um, and I know this court is reticent to ever get to a second issue if they dismiss something on subject matter jurisdiction, uh, but especially a constitutional issue. But the actual award of parenting time here, and knowing that this type of award of parenting time, let's say there was subject matter jurisdiction here, that the trial courts are granting that type of parenting time to a non-parent, despite pretty clear Arizona case law, and specifically out of the, this division, is, is scary. That's a lot of parenting time. I mean, when you look at the underlying case, obviously everything has to go back to Troxel because that's the, you know, the, the main case we have to look at because that's where the Supreme Court dictated uh, non-parents' rights and, and, or the state's rights, state's power to do any sort of legislation act and non-parent rights. It's, even if you follow the, the steps to grant the non-parent visitation, you can still violate the parents' rights. So I can give lip service to the steps, but in, at the end of the day, 130 days dictates. Is that per se unconstitutional in every case? 130 days? Yeah. Real, I realize this court would probably very ever pick a bright line rule. Well, because let me suggest to you a hypothetical, okay? Um, <clears throat> child is born in wedlock, but dad dies. Um, mom remarries. Um, for 14 years, step, stepdad and mom raise the child. But mom has a substance abuse problem. And the child becomes dependent, is, is is adjudicated dependent as to mom. Parents get divorced, and dad asks for time under twenty five four zero nine. Stepdad asks for time under twenty five four zero nine. Are you saying that the the, the parent um, who who has been preliminarily adjudicated unfit, but is still a legal parent? Uh, has rights sufficient to preclude a parenting time award of that magnitude? Well, I, I think you'd, you wouldn't even get to the non-parent visitation part of 409. You'd get to the in loco parentis custody part because you could easily meet in that situation the significantly detrimental prong to give somebody else actual legal custody. You could also obviously do it in the juvenile court where any third party, the grandparents, neighbors, cousins, could probably get custody of the child. So I don't think you'd get to the non-parent visitation. Still got a natural parent with a fundamental right. And Troxel has never I, stated I your, that dependencies answer, superseded or... Your answer is a good one under the statute. Um, it, it's, it's an astute uh, approach to the statute, but my question related to the constitutionality of the order. And are you, because you, you've raised a constitutional issue, so when you, when you say this is of such magnitude that it can't, it, it must necessarily offend Troxel. I'm just wondering, is that true in every, in every case? I'll add a caveat. If there's a fit parent, then yes. Without the caveat, then no. Troxel clearly holds that, except if the safety well-being of the child, that Troxel upheld, upholds, and the readings of Troxel have upheld all the seatbelt laws and you know bike helmets and all these things. The difference between ours is there's, in your hypothetical, Judge Swan, there's not a fit parent. So juvenile court could take the kid, and eat that that has been upheld under Troxel repeatedly in in every situation. So I'd like to save the rest of my time for rebuttal.
May it please the court, my name is Taylor Young and I represent Bonnie Jean Reynolds in this special action. As uh, the questions from the bench have already indicated, this is a tricky case. Uh, and I think, Judge Swan, your observation that did the legislature intend the interpretation which is being offered uh, here uh, is, a, is a good question. And it's really the critical question is what was the intent? Well, I mean, the first indicator of intent is the words the legislature used, and the legislature has apparently regretted some of its choices in the past and changed statutes afterward. But we are bound by the language of the statute, aren't we? There, there's no question that you're bound by the language of the statute. Uh, as I was preparing for oral argument, um, the, the principal argument here is that uh, Section 8117 sort of imports this notion of uh, lawful wedlock into 409. And that's based on the argument in the Maricopa County case, the JA50, et cetera. But as I was looking at the statute, uh, you know, the, originally you look at the statutory history and we have those, those notes that say in, in 1999, this was three years after the Maricopa County case, uh, the statute was amended and West has put in the notes that, uh, that there are no substantive amendments. But in looking at the language, actually section 8117A was substantively, I would argue, amended in 1999, three years after the decision that uh, Ms. Sheets is relying on in this case. And the important amendment there is that the legislature took out the words the same. So when the N. Ray Maricopa County case was decided, uh, the statute, and you can read it in the footnote of the case, the statute said that the natural relationship of child and parents shall thereafter exist between the adopted person and the adoptive petition petitioner, the same as though the child were born to the adoptive parent, uh, sorry, adoptive petitioner in lawful wedlock. And then the next sentence goes on to talk about inheritance. And it also says that uh, the adoptive petitioner shall be entitled to inherit the real and personal property from and through the adoptive child, the same as though the child were born to the adoptive petitioner in lawful wedlock. Well, in 1999, the first clause was amended to remove that. So now the statute says that the natural relationship of child and parent thereafter exists between the adoptive child and the adoptive parent as though the child were born to the adoptive parent in, long, in lawful wedlock. But the next sentence regarding inheritance, the legislature did not remove the, la the language the same and kept it as the same as though. So okay. what do you think the significance of that is? Well, I think what, if you look at the definitions of the words the, the same, and you look at the definition of as though, we turn to Miriam Webster and uh, take a look at those definitions, what we see is that as though means as if. It's an, it's an analogous context. Uh, it's, it roughly means analogous, whereas the same means being one without addition, change, or uh, discontinuance, or identical. So do I think this is the strongest leg to stand on uh, in, terms of in terms of understanding the legislative language? No. But what I do think is that we have a statute that this court decided back in 1996, imported that language in, and said, this means, the effect of this adoption uh, language means that in the context, and again, it was in the grandparents' uh, rights statute back then, uh, but in this context, what that means is that uh, you, an adopted child is to be treated legally as born in lawful wedlock. That's where the legal fiction uh, comes in. The legislature then subsequently amends the statute and amends the first portion of the statute, not the inheritance piece, but amends the first portion of the statute, which is the statute that the court relied upon, and removes the words the same to just say as though. And I think that that is an indicator that 
there was a real change going on. Otherwise, why remove it in one clause and not remove it in the next? It's right there. It's still just a bit of a redundancy, the same as if, as if, I'm not sure I understand any difference if you leave out the, the term the same as. Oh, I think a principle of statutory construction is that we have to give the words their meaning. And so when the legislature, I, Judge Katani, if, if they had simply removed the same in both clauses, say, okay, this is just cleaning up language. But they didn't. They left the same as well, though in the second clause. They were cryptic then as, as to... But I think, they were off, I think they were awfully cryptic if their notion was that when we are going to amend this statute in 2012, we want to um, prevent adop adoptive kids from having any option of in loco parentis uh, visitation. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to refer to lawful wedlock, born in lawful, lawful wedlock. That's how we are going to accomplish this result, because we know that there's 8117A, and we're going to import that language in. Um, one of the things that we also pointed out in our brief, which the other side did not respond to when, when writing their reply, is the effect of uh, 25-1401. And 25-1401 is a statute that says every child is the legitimate child of its natural parents as a title to support and education as if born in lawful wedlock. Well, there's a legal fiction that says every natural child is to be treated legally as if born in lawful wedlock. Well, for purposes of support, but does that statute for really extend beyond support? It, it's for purposes of support and education. We would go to uh, the probate statute to see inheritance, but inheritance isn't the operative language that was being relied upon in the N. Ray Maricopa County case. Um, it was the legal rights. Um, if, it was, if it was about inheritance, then our argument about the legislative intention control, which is that this statute, when it was 8117, when it was originally drafted, had nothing to do with uh, uh, other legal rights, it was really directed towards the notion of inheritance. And 25-1401, of course, legitimizes all children, and we have, there's a bunch of cases that say that there's no distinction between a legitimate and illegitimate child in Arizona. Um, so I'm not suggesting that we should... No, but there, there should... may be a distinction between parents of children who, who have hesitate to use those terms, but parents of children who are born in and out of wedlock, there seems to be a clear distinction in the statute, um, and the legislature may very well perceive that uh, while, while the children have equal standing, the parents do not. The, the distinction, yeah, there is, and we, we have case law that says that there's no illegitimate children in Arizona, there are only illegitimate parents, so that would dovetail with your argument, I think, Judge Swan. But, the, in looking at the statute and trying to determine what the legislature meant, what was intended, I agree that it's the, these are arbitrary and random distinctions that are drawn under the statute. Um, it is a puzzle. Uh, I, I smiled a bit, Judge Swan, when you said if there's a matrix, because on, on the wall of my office there is a matrix, trying to figure out exactly what, who counts, who can get visitation and who can't, and what is the rationale for the distinctions that are being drawn in the statute. And it's really hard to come up with any rationale that, uh, that makes any sense at all. There's no constitutional to the, uh, challenge to the statute at issue before us. And so even if the matrix is thoroughly arbitrary and unfair, is that something we can address? It is something that you can address in the sense of your duty is to interpret the statute constitutionally, right, within constitutional mandates. Um, and so it is possible, and, and we, the other side came forth in its uh, reply and said, no, the legislature intended this exact result that we have here. And what if and it so, did? What, what if the legislature debated this case and came up with a, a statute more clearly written that specifically prescribe the result Mr. Berkshire seeks? Would that be unconstitutional? It would be, I think, subject to challenge in terms of a random and arbitrary distinction being made. We'd have to see what is the rationale for treating adoptive kids 
parents who are kids who are born out of wedlock and again that born out of wedlock language if you go traipsing through the statutes it's it's hard to discover what the distinction what distinctions are being drawn when um, well the rationale could be we want to encourage adoptions and making adoptive parents uh, any less uh, powerful under under the law would be a diminution of those rights and, and we don't we don't feel that adoptive parents should face that stigma what if what if the legislature said that if the legislature said so adoptive parents well let's go back to the matrix and let me let me let's look at the distinctions because as I think the court is uh, the questions uh, suggest it's difficult to look at the legislature and and determine that there was some it, discriminatory intent or other intent here um, I, I looked at it uh, and I don't see anything I looked at the legislative history of of what the legislature did back in 1997 when it created uh, the in loco parentis visitation and the subsequent amendments and I don't see an intent to uh, a direct intent uh, any kind of expressed intent to treat same-sex couples for example differently uh, it just doesn't seem to be there uh, uh, it may the same-sex aspect of this case seems uh, actually not to, to go to the core of the case the it the only the the only way it does is that obviously as as the courts pointed out in argument uh, in the questions uh, Bonnie and Lori were not in a position to marry and thereby take an action that a heterosexual couple would have been able to do right so if they are looking at what their rights are at the time of adoption um, they could not have decided we are going to get married and therefore we will be able to jointly adopt yes uh, and their 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 <clears throat> rights have expanded you know at, at least in the abstract uh, over over the past year but but those those rights are not really the rights we're talking about today I, I, I do agree with you. However, the rights of my client have not expanded. She could have received in loco parentis visitation. At least the court would have had the power or subject matter jurisdiction at the time when Emily was adopted. Um, because at the time when Emily was adopted, the statute did not read that you had to be born, the child had to be born out of wedlock. Um, in that instance, the only, it, we, the only thing that she would have required for in loco parentis visitation would have been a, to establish that uh, the that uh, Lori was not married. And under the Thomas case, uh, it's pretty straightforward. The statute is subsequently amended during the pendency of this relationship. The, sub, the statute is amended, and it did shrink my client's rights in that sense. So, she, if she, if they're ordering their lives when they're making the adoption decision, um, my client say, if heaven forbid this relationship dissolves, at least I can get in loco parentis visitation. And their argument is now. And I, I don't think that they would disagree with that. They might disagree with the visitation portion of the order, but I don't think they would disagree that under the old statute, uh, the court had the power to entertain the uh, petition and grant visitation rights if the other elements were established. But the only rights diminished by the amendment were, were theoretical at that point because no petition had been filed and no ruling had been made. So uh, right. there's it, no it, unconstitutional retroactive diminution of rights. And you don't see that in our brief. I, 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 we're this as I said this is a uh, this is a tricky case in which we don't think that the court I'm sorry we don't think that the legislature uh, intended the result here um, and if you look at the legislative history and you look at what what uh, the for example the house summary sheets and the Senate summary sheets they they say all right we're going to take this grandparent piece and we're going to take this in loco parentis piece and we'll just combine them together and now it's you know conjunctive. I wish I could argue it was disjunctive. It's not. It's conjunctive. It says born out of wedlock and um, and that the uh, parents are or legal parents are not married at the time of the petition. Um, it is not clear to me that the legislature intended this result. The other thing is I wanted to point out to what was the trial court thinking when the trial court. Uh, entered the ruling saying that the child was born or adopted out of wedlock. Um, 
And I think what the court was doing was looking at how do I interpret this language? How do I interpret my uh, this element here under 409? And when you look at the, if you look at what each of these sections is actually, again, sort of getting back to the matrix, is actually intending to do, it becomes pretty clear that what the legislature is pointing at is, is there a marriage relationship that exists that has been disrupted? Is it is there one that exists? or And if it exists, has it been disrupted in some ways? If you look at each of the prongs, that's really what they seem to be getting to. Um, so we have parents who, where one parent has died or gone missing for at least three months, right? That's a disruption in relationship. We have the in loco parentis rights for visitation rights for uh, a pending divorce. So in that instance, if the marriage relationship is in the process of divorce, you can petition for in loco parentis. And if you're a grandparent, you can petition if there has been a divorce and it's over three months. And then we have the section that we're talking about today, which is born out of wedlock and the legal parents are not married to each other. Of course, if the child was born out of wedlock and then the legal parents subsequently marry, that even under old common law, that legitimizes the child. And so I don't know, it's, a, it's sort of a peculiar structure. Um, and what happens if they subsequently marry, subsequently marry but then get divorced? Now suddenly you can petition for in loco parentis, but if they hadn't had the subsequent marriage, you couldn't have, or if there had been a, a, there had been a single parent adoption. So I think what the trial court was looking at here, when the trial court said in the disjunctive born or adopted out of wedlock, is that the trial court recognized that all of this is about do we have a single parent here? And if we have a single parent, the legislature seems to be saying, okay, or if we have a marriage relationship, if we don't have a marriage relationship, the legislature seems to be, okay, in those circumstances, you can move forward. And so that's the, uh, the reasoning why I think this or adopted language is in there. But I don't think the court needs to reach that issue because the uh, finding in the, in the case is born or adopted. Um, and they're not disputing, and in fact, they're, being very careful in their papers uh, not to dispute that this child was factually, this ch Emily's natural parents were not married to each other when she was born. Um, she was born out of wedlock. And so they're being very careful not to, to rely on the legal fiction and not to make that argument. Um, it's true that if you're looking at a finding, a disjunctive finding is probably not the best finding I would like, but I don't see any reason why the court can't uh, sort of blue pencil the or adopt it if they want and say that there's uh, sufficient evidence to uh, support jurisdiction. Blue pencil a statute? <laughs> not the statute, the court's ruling. We don't even blue pencil restrictive covenants. I, I, I was being, uh, I, I, I was being imprecise, Judge Swan, I apologize. I mean, we could do the same thing uh, someone was born out of wedlock, and now the person seeking parenting time uh, was a caregiver who, uh, a daycare provider who was uh, very close to the child, had a very close relationship for a number of years. In, in your mind, in your view, is it because they were born out of wedlock, would that change the analysis? Well, yeah, it certainly changes the analysis in that if they were born out of wedlock, the they statute says they can. Oh, but they had been subsequently adopted by a single parent or by uh, by two parents. By a, <laughs> by a single parent, I think that the the that does not change uh, the answers that they would be they would be statutorily they would be um, entitled to petition, and the court could, if all of the other factors are met, the court could grant. Uh, Visitation, and I want and Judge Katani, we we tend to, uh, and and Mr. Berkshire did this too. We tend to drift from visitation to parenting to visitation, and this is not parenting time. This is visitation, and it's an important distinction. Um, and I think Mr. Berkshire's argument that this is somehow per se unconstitutional and allows my client to direct the upbringing of the child because there's a 35 percent time every other weekend. I, he argues it very passionately, but he has not pointed to anything that suggests that 
every other weekend time in this kind of context with all of these other factors allows my client to direct the upbringing of the child. And in fact, my client does not have any rights uh, apart from what has have been granted to her by the by the parent in terms of directing education or medical or any of those issues. My time's expired. May it please the court. I, I, this is a different statute that hasn't been interpreted yet. It is different than Thomas, and I think that's a place to start. Thomas is the is an O2 case, and the statute was meant, amended after it, and it was amended unquestionably to be more restrictive because there is a conjunctive now in what statute Thomas interpreted where there was just a single prong. There is now two prongs. The statute is even tighter in other areas that for in loco parentis, the petition has to be pending, which implies that you couldn't do it after, um, potentially after a, the marriage was dissolved. <clears throat> the, well, I'd argue that we don't need to get to legislative intent because of the plain meaning of the statute. I think Judge Swan's point about potentially encouraging St the state encouraging single parent adoptions. It was something that I had debated bringing up um, during this in our briefs, which is two parents adopt. There's no potential for a um, in loco parentis case unless they get divorced. A single parent, anybody that they date, any nanny, any caregiver, any neighbor has that potential. And that could easily be read as the intent here that we want to encourage single parent adoptions because there's a lot of kids that need to be adopted. As in this case, they were foster, the child was a foster kid. That could easily be read to be the intent. Although, like I said, I don't think we need to get there. And with that, my time's expired too. Uh, thank you both for your argument. Uh, and again, thank you both for your willingness to uh, change the procedures a little bit in this case and, uh, and provide supplemental briefing. Uh, we appreciate it. It's been helpful. Uh, and with that, we'll take this matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course.